All right. It is my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Sabir Sochdev from Harvard University. Uh, Sabir needs, for, for this week's uh, CMTC seminar, uh, Sabir probably needs no introduction to uh, this, uh, this crowd, but um, uh, just as a brief overview, um, he has uh, he did his uh, PhD at Harvard and has been making seminal contributions to a wide range of areas of uh, condensed matter physics and, and beyond for quite some time, from quantum criticality to um, to SYK models uh, to magnetism to FL star and uh, strange metals, and uh, so. That is the, I guess, the strange quantum physics of the high temperature superconductors is his topic today. So take it away, Sabir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Danny. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, of course, I'm sorry I can't meet all of you in person, but uh, hopefully I'll get to meet some of you this afternoon. And, and please feel free to interrupt uh, in my talk. So I, I debated a bit uh, what I should really talk about. Uh, high temperature superconductors is an old subject, and uh, many of you don't want to hear more about it. Uh, but I decided to talk about it anyway uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, there have been a, a number of experiments in the last uh, year or two, which I think are very interesting and which are uh, supportive of the picture that I'm going to present. Uh, and then also, of course, theoretically, there are some interesting developments uh, that I really want to talk about. So, so anyway, so bear with me, and uh, I, I promise there'll be something you haven't heard before. Okay, so, but, but let me just at least quickly review some of the issues for the benefit of those who are new to this field. Uh, so we're interested in uh, these materials, so like yttrium barium copper oxide, and the dominant excitations are in uh, a square lattice of copper ions. And there's one, around one electron per copper site, uh, which is then hopping on the square lattice. So as a function of the, the density of holes away from an antiferromagnetic insulator, I'll show some more careful discussion of the microscopics in a minute. Uh, so then that at zero doping, there's a insulator. And then you get a high temperature superconductor, which uh, has TCs at high as uh, 100 Kelvin. Uh, but my interest today will be on neither of these phases, but will be on this region here where we have metallic phases. But these metallic phases uh, turn out to uh, be you know, quite interesting. And at, you know, the point of view is that once it's, we really need to understand these metals, because a lot of the interesting physics happens already at rather high temperatures, like 250 Kelvin. Uh, and superconductivity is some instability and really largely well understood instability of the parent metal. So just like PCS theory was of instability of the Fermi liquid, we have to then ask what, what is the metallic state from which you get a high temperature superconductor? So there's roughly three regimes that I will say something about. At low doping, we have what's called a pseudo gap metal. And then at high doping, we have a familiar Fermi liquid. And these are possibly separated at zero temperature by some quantum phase transition at a critical doping PC. Uh, and in between, there is a region that's sometimes called a strange metal, which may be or may not be, depending on who you talk to, associated with this quantum critical point uh, of a PC. Okay. So that's the big picture. Uh, so let me give a microscopic picture. So in the, uh, also a very simple microscopic picture, which I think, uh, which at least give you intuitive feeling of what's going on. So at half filling, you have at P equals zero, you have a uh, one electron per site and they found this checkerboard arrangement uh, called the nail state. There's an exchange between them, J, and that leads to quantum fluctuations of the spins. Uh, then you're going to dope this with a few holes of density P. So P counts the density of holes from the antiferromagnet. And these holes can move around with a matrix element T. Uh, and so now you have the famous TJ model that describes uh, both the motion of the holes and the spin fluctuations. So now the key question that experiments address. Yes, question from someone? Okay. 
so the key question that one of the questions that experiments address is what is the density of carriers? So if you you know if you use your favorite method of measuring the density of carriers, what is the answer? So in this picture of a P mobile holes in a background of spins, if you just think of the holes moving around and the spins fluctuating in some way in that background of moving holes, you would conclude that first of all, the, the density of carriers is P uh, and it's a positive charge. So you should see the Hall effect associated with P carriers of positive charge, just the empty size. Okay, so that would be the kind of a, what you call a real space picture. And it, in fact, crudely, there's no, you know, there's no doubt that that picture is correct. Uh, of course, we have to figure out how to fill in a lot a of detail. Shibir, may I ask yes. a question of this in a very simple picture? Yes, please. Since I have been writing some papers with Rick Green, referees are asking all kinds of questions, and I realize the situation from a material science viewpoint is very complex. There are all these Fermi surface reconstructions at various values of X and so on and so forth. So is that going to come yeah, into that, this That's what my about? talk, absolutely, that's what my talk is okay, about. Good. All right, just, good. Okay, I'll I, wait. I'm just setting the, just yeah, setting the stage. Okay, thanks. So anyway, but if you don't think of, you know, if you're just uh, a simple-minded person who's not thinking of Fermi surface, you say, oh yeah, this is trivial, just P holes moving uh, in a background of antiferromagnets. Uh, but, and this picture, simple-minded picture, crudely speaking, is correct at small p. But at larger p, the simple-minded picture doesn't work. But another picture works with someone who knows a little more solid state physics. There you say, well, actually, you know, you should really think of this in terms of uh, Fermi liquid theory uh, and think of the holes moving around uh, and the electrons moving around, really. And as the electrons move, they can, uh, they can really have double occupancy, uh, no problem, because what they like, the electrons like to think in momentum space. So you should really think in momentum space. So in momentum space, there's a filled band. And relative to this filled band, the number of holes that you put in here in momentum space is not P, it's one plus P. Because uh, the number of electrons here, the arrows is one minus P. So in this momentum space view, we seem to work at larger P, uh, you should see a Fermi surface corresponding either to one minus P electrons or one plus P holes. So if you do for, and if you do photo emission, that is indeed what you see at larger P. This is P greater than PC. There you do see a very nice Fermi surface uh, with, and if you measure the area of this region, it's one plus P and this is one minus P. So this momentum space picture of nearly free electrons, you know, perfectly gives you the shape of the Fermi surface. So, okay. However, when you go to lower P, uh, it's not at all clear what's going on. Uh, you see some strange arc-like features in photo emission. Uh, so where are, where are, we had a simple moment, real space intuition. In momentum space, it's a real mess. And really one of the big question is how do you fit? How do you understand this, this arc-like feature uh, in, in some, some theory? What is this due to? Uh, okay, now there is a way to get arc-like features and, and, but really it's pockets which have a backside here uh, in, in simple theory. And that simple theory is one where you have a broken symmetry like antiferromagnetism. But the doping density at which you see this arc-like feature, there doesn't seem to be any obvious sign in any experiment of antiferromagnetism, at least in the whole dope cube race. Okay, so that's one of the, you know, the big issues. Uh, so, so I promised to tell you about some recent experiments. So here's an experiment not yet published uh, by Brad Ramshaw and uh, Louis Taifer and their groups. Uh, and what they did is something called angle dependent magneto resistance. So this is uh, not quite photo emission, uh, but it's, it can be done in a magnetic field and in a magnet, you apply a magnetic field and then you measure the resistance along this axis as a function of the angle of the field. Uh, and from that resistance, you can uh, say something about uh, the shape of the Fermi surface. So I won't go into any, any details here. Uh, they do some uh, modeling based on, you know, some quasi-particle picture of excitations. And if you're in this uh, large Fermi surface regime of large, where the photo emission made complete sense, uh, the ADMR also makes complete sense. Um, you, you know, so this is, 
the calculation, this is the data, and you, as of for different temperatures and angles. Uh, and the calculation is based upon this Fermi surface, which is this big Fermi surface that it's called, which is what you would deduce from uh, just band theory. And it works beautifully. Uh, but if you do the same, uh, uh, you measure the same data uh, uh, at low doping, uh, then you see a very different, uh, I think the, the thick full lines here are the data as a function of angle. Uh, and, and, you know, these are two different angles, phi and theta, I guess. They have this angle and then the angle theta around the z-axis. Uh, and then they try to fit this data to some guesses as to what the Fermi surface might be. Uh, and the one that fits, which is shown here, uh, is, is this pocket. Yeah, there's these pockets. The others don't fit at all. Uh, and, and these pockets would correspond to, you know, the same pocket I showed you here, but with the back size closed. So the point is photo emission depends on what's called the quasi-particle residue. You're knocking out bare electrons from a material. Uh, and so the amplitude for that depends on the overlap between a bare electron and a normalized electron. So you could say that there really is a pocket here, but the quasi-particle residue is large on this side of the pocket and not on the back side of the pocket. Uh, whereas ADMR, you're not knocking anything out of anything. You're just measuring the quasi-particle, whatever it is. So you're not sensitive to quasi-particle residue. Uh, and therefore, you would just, in principle, see the whole pocket wherever quasi-particles are present, uh, no matter their overlap with the bare quasi-particle. So, so now, so this model, in fact, you know, you can ask, is there a model that gives you this? It can explain this. And there is a model. Uh, and they say here, uh, we find that a data is most consistent with the Fermi surface that have been reconstructed by antiferromagnetic order at pi pi. So if you did calculate, just assume there was antiferromagnetism, like there is at p equals zero, uh, then you would find Fermi surface of this shape. And you would even find, in fact, that the quasi-particle residue is such that it's much larger on this side than on the back side. So everything looks great. Yeah, you solved the problem if you just looked at these data. Uh, the, only, uh, the only trouble is that there is no antiferromagnetism. You, uh, uh, you can study that by various other probes, like you know, NMR or neutron scattering, and there's no sign of it. So that's, to me, that's one of the biggest puzzles. What is the answer to this question? And this data by the ADMR data really uh, sharpens the precise question on the nature of the underdog regime. Uh, how do you explain uh, these small Fermi surface and the low density carriers without any broken symmetry? And that's what my whole talk is about. Uh, how, what are different ways you can uh, get small density carriers without any broken symmetry? Uh, I also show here some other data. Uh, this is a bit older, but only a couple of years. If you measure the what's called the gamma value of the specific heat, C over T, uh, this is would be just related to the effective mass of the quasi-particles on the Fermi surface for a circular Fermi surface. Uh, and that seems to have a big peak right at the critical doping where you go from P greater than PC or P less than PC. Uh, and if you measure the Hall effect, this is in high fields, you again see consistently with the very simple-minded picture that you have density P here and one plus P here. Okay. All right. So, so that sets up some background before I dive into uh, my theory of, so the talk will be really about just talking about metals and, and how can you go from a, a metal with this type of Fermi surface for P less than PC to a metal with that type of Fermi surface for P greater than PC. Uh, how can you, first of all, describe those two types of metals and what can you say about the phase transition between them? You know, that's, that's the basic question we are interested in. I, I can't say we completely solved it, but I'll tell you about some, uh, some progress, uh, which we're pretty excited about. So any, this would be a good time for questions before I dive into all the stuff we've been doing. Hopefully you all got the, the basic question I'm trying to address. I have a question. Do we have yeah. any examples of a metallic antiferromagnet? I mean, most antiferromagnets 
are insulated, right? Oh, well, I would say the electron dope cuprates are a good example where they are metallic at uh, low doping. In fact, they go superconducting eventually. But uh, the but... antifilomagnetism has ever been seen in electron dope cuprates, right? Oh, no, no, no. It's no. definitely seen. You see long range order antiferromagnetism, and I mean, they're experiments by Martin Graven. In, in the metallic uh, phase? In the metallic phase? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Up to about 14% doping. Okay. Uh, there's also various heavy fermion compounds. I think cerium copper to silicon too, uh, the metallic antiferromagnet. All right. Uh, so then, then in And then, of course, I should say the nictides. I mean, the nictides, they're antiferromagnetism at pi zero, not pi pi. Mm -hmm. They're metallic. They're, they're probably the best example. I should have mentioned those before. Yeah. Okay. So these are all recent. So your theory then will distinguish electron doped cuprates from whole doped cuprates, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, electron doped cuprates at some level, we don't need a theory. We have the spin density wave theory would, would okay. basically right. work. Okay. I understand that. Uh, yeah. But even there, if you start looking in more detail right near the critical point, it there are issues with it. So, so there, some aspects of the physics I'll talk about may also be relevant for electron dope, but they are less relevant. I mean, I think for the cuprates, the whole dope cuprates is where the, this issue is the, the sharpest and very clear. Yeah. yeah so there is, uh, okay, I, I, I won't go into these details here, but there is, a, you know, as I said, there, uh, here, what you could understand this by antiferromagnetism, um, and the, and you could imagine the transition from here to there happens just by the disappearance of antiferromagnetism, and then you can look at the theory of that, which is sometimes called the Hertz-Millis theory. Uh, but what I only mentioned this very in passing. Uh, the, there's this new phenomenon that you know normally we have this prejudice that once you know the two phases and their symmetries then you fully understood the nature of the phase transition between them. That, but we now have examples of cases that that's not true, that even the transition between an ordered antiferromagnet and a regular Fermi liquid uh, can be exotic, <laughs> frank. Uh, okay, but I, I mostly won't go into that. And that may well be relevant for the electron dope cube phrase. And there's examples of similar phenomena in the, in the heavy fermion compounds. Okay, any other questions? All right, so now let me dive into my talk. So as I said, the theme of the talk uh, is metal to metal transitions without a broken symmetry. Uh, and in fact, the simplest place where it's reasonably well understood, theoretically, uh, and there are even Corne Monte Carlo studies of such things, uh, and and there is uh, you know possible applications to the heavy fermion compounds is a metal metal transition in the condo lattice. So let me first describe that. Uh, I'm not claiming that there's a condo lattice in cuprates. Uh, I've already told you the band structure of the cuprates, the simplified version of it. Uh, it has only one band, uh, and I'll turn to the one band case later. Okay, so first let me remind you what's the condo effect. Uh, so the condo effect is you have a bunch of electrons which move around, we call them the C electrons, uh, the conduction electrons, which just form a Fermi liquid. And then there's one electron which is on some F orbital, uh, so it's trapped there. Uh, and this electron only degree of freedom is the spin. So spin can rotate and there's some exchange coupling between the trapped electron and the mobile electron called the condo coupling. All right, so what we learned in the 60s and later was that this condo coupling uh, is always relevant. Uh, that is, if you go to low enough temperatures, this, this coupling effectively becomes infinite. Uh, and what that means is that this, this moment, so if you're at very high temperatures, you know, there's an electron trapped here, and you will see a Curie susceptibility of that thing. It would behave like a free, free spin with a one over T susceptibility. When you go to low temperatures, that moment disappears. And basically, this, uh, this spin uh, dissolves into the Fermi C. It just gets screened by the other electrons and forms singlets with them over long range and, and, and basically disappears. So that's Condo 101 <laughs> in a very simple language. Uh, and of course, you know, there's huge amounts of theories and 
our team was developed to understand this problem and so on and so forth. But now let's consider the condo lattice uh, where you have many, not just one spin, but a whole lattice of spins. So this is what we call the F band and this is the C band. Uh, and this would be a very appropriate for the so-called heavy fermion compound, where there's some uh, compound like cerium or uranium, which has these spins. Uh, and then there's whatever copper and silicon, which is providing the conduction electron. So there's really a, a genuine difference microscopically between the electrons that left to be localized because they're in F orbitals and the conduction band. All right. So now you can ask what happens here. So here, the situation turns out to be different. Uh, it's not true, although it was believed to be true in some early days, uh, that that no matter how small JK, it becomes really extremely important at at uh, low temperatures. But if JK is above some you know above some value, say here, then basically you have a lattice version of the Kondo effect. So what that means is that all these spins disappear; they dissolve into the Fermi C. Okay, what's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence of the, these F spins dissolving the Fermi C uh, is that you get a metal, but now you can ask what is the size of the Fermi surface? What is the density of mobile electrons uh, in, this, uh, in this Fermi C in which these F spins have dissolved into, the, uh, uh, into C? So in fact, the way you talk about this uh, is that um, you think of the F electrons uh, as actual electrons, not just spins. And then there's some uh, hybridization uh, that sp develops spontaneously as you lower the temperature. Uh, so this hybridization, which allows the C F electrons to just become part of the C electron con conduction sheet. So there's some, this, this operator acquires an expectation value. Okay. And so the most important property, uh, oops, I guess I haven't written it. Uh, let me go back. Yeah, so the most important property when this happens uh, is that the size of the, what is the size of the Fermi C? Well, the size of the Fermi C is what we say is large, uh, meaning it counts both the F and the C. So that's the lattice version of the Kondo effect. Uh, the lattice version of the Kondo effect uh, is that when the F electron spins become screened by the conduction electrons, uh, they become part of the Fermi C. And so if there was a density P of uh, C electrons and density one of F, so there's one, elect one F electron per site, the size of the Fermi surface would be one plus P. And I really should have written that here, okay. All right, so that's what's called the theory of the heavy Fermi liquid. And, uh, and it turns out the only memory of the fact that these F electrons were localized initially before they dissolved into the Fermi C uh, is that the quasi-particle mass can be very large, up to a thousand times larger than the bare electron mass. And that gives us the theory of the heavy Fermi liquid. And this is all well understood. Here are some of the people who worked this out. I didn't have anything to do with it. Okay. But Okay, so that's the qualitative picture. But now, you know, now there's a lot of developments on these kind of things uh, today, and there's a different way we talk about this. Uh, so what we would say is the following. Uh, you had these F electron spins, and you so you can take the spins and write it in terms of F tag or F this way. Uh, and these spins are not really mobile. So the F electron is really not mobile, strictly speaking. And so that means that uh, there's a gauge symmetry, not a global symmetry, but there's a gauge symmetry where I, change the, I can change the phase of each F by uh, a space and in fact, even time dependent factor and nothing will change because F dagger sigma F will not change when you make this change. So there's a underlying gauge symmetry uh, in the theory. But then what about this guy? This guy obviously breaks the gauge symmetry because it has only one F. The C don't carry this gauge charge. So this object, C dagger F, you could think of as a bound state of, an, of a C electron in a hole on the F or vice versa. 
And this bound state is a boson or an exciton, but it's a Higgs boson or a Higgs exciton uh, because it's got a gauge charge. So when it condenses, you're really breaking the gauge symmetry uh, by this Higgs condensate. And that's what the Fermi liquid is. So the Fermi liquid in this picture is nothing but the Higgs phase of a human gauge theory. And it's the broken gauge symmetry then that leads to uh, a large Fermi surface. Okay, so that's the modern way of talking about things that were understood a long time ago without this modern language. All right, but the advantage of the modern way, now it, it, it sets up what else can happen. So this is the boring thing in some sense, just get uh, the large Fermi surface where every electron counts. Uh, so can you get some other phase? Well, obviously from the gauge theory language, you can get another phase uh, if you don't break the gauge symmetry. So can the gauge symmetry remain unbroken? So, so yeah, before I get there, so this large Fermi surface phase uh, has size one plus P. And if I want to write on a wave function, I would say, well, you take, imagine that there is no constraint of the F electrons. Um, and just make a slater determinant of C and F with some hybridization. But then you have to remember there was a constraint uh, and that you do by this projection. So this gives you a variational wave function, which we believe will have a large Fermi surface of size one plus P. And, and you know, a natural question here is, well, what about this projection? It isn't gonna destroy what you started with. And, and you know the whole purpose of the gauge theory was is has, is to show that it doesn't that really it has fairly mild effects, and the naive picture we just ignored the projection is not too far or off, far off from the truth. Okay. Uh, and and of course the Luttinger theorem is obeyed because you're counting every electron as Luttinger said you should in a Fermi liquid. Modulo two, uh, of course, uh, because two corresponds to a filled band. All right, so then, as I said this, what is the other possibility? Well, the other possibility uh, is that JK doesn't flow to infinity under RG. And then what happens then? Well, then this, basically these two systems, even though they are coupled, it's as if they are uncoupled. So the uh, conduction electrons move around and have density P uh, okay, so then they have what's called a small Fermi surface of size P. And what do the F electrons do? Well, the F electrons form a mod insulator uh, on their own. So this sometimes called a selective mod transition uh, in some other context, uh, or a condo breakdown transition because the, uh, there is no more condo screening. And what the F electrons are doing, well, they're forming what we call a spin liquid. They form singlets with each other, but not with the Cs. Uh, and so there's some resonating valence bond picture, if you wish, um, of these F electrons. So, yes. So, sure. Uh, there's an exchange between the F spins, F electron spins. So, mm -hmm. is, should I be thinking of JK compared to that exchange? Yes, so that would be roughly where this transition happens, correct. Okay, thank you. I mean, there would also be some RKK, like, so there's always some exchange between the F spins, even if the bare value is zero, mm. uh, because of, uh, you know, you can go virtually through there, the RKK Y coupling. Uh, so there's some RKK Y couplings anyway. Uh, so you would have to really compare, even if the bare exchange was zero, the JK with the RKKY couplings between the F electrons. But the but the uh, Hubbard U that localizes Fs is the largest like energy scale. Yeah, that's infinity. That's really playing no role. Yeah, yeah. So, let me just follow up on what Leo just said. So, this is a very strange system then. It's a system where an insulator is hybridizing with a metal and somehow maintaining its identity. I mean, nominally... Well, you know, this, this picture is, of course, a crude picture. Uh, it's not to be taken too literally. Just, they, they, they're mixing completely with each other. 
It's a medal. Okay, it's a medal. It's a medal. Right. Got in the it's medal. just okay. a medal. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but what is strange about the medal mm -hmm. is that it doesn't obey the Lattinger theorem. It's just right. a medal. Right. Uh, and you measure a Fermi surface. Mm -hmm. Now, the Fermi surface in the simplest picture is just C electrons, but really not. It's C plus a little bit of F thrown into. It's, it's a complicated object, mm -hmm. but it's just a, or we can say that there's a Fermi surface, which is a, of spin a half charge E fermions, which microscopically may be very complicated. And we can say that the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface uh, is not one plus P as you would expect from the Luttinger theorem, but P. So that's the sharp statement that it's- Okay, I, I get you now. It's because the existence of- It is violating. Okay. Yeah, so this is an exotic state, which would not be allowed uh, by, you know, by, by the Luttinger theorem to all orders in perturbation theory, no matter, you know, if you did perturbation in U, you would not find this phase in any order. You could not find it because Luttinger theorem has to be obeyed order by order in perturbation theory. Uh, so it's a non-perturbative phase that we claim exists. Now there is a non-perturbative Luttinger theorem that was proposed by uh, Oshikawa uh, based on a Laughlin-like argument where you take the system and you insert flux uh, in it, and you look at how the system changes when you insert one flux quantum. Uh, but it turns out that Oshikawa's proof shows you not only it's a correct proof, but it also shows you how you can get around it. So uh, it shows you that, uh, one second, I have to charge my mic. Uh, it shows you that there is a way, there's a loophole uh, and that's what we showed in this paper uh, with uh, Voita and Sento. Uh, and the loophole is that if if there is topological order, <laughs> and, and these, in other words, this these uh, this f electrons can be any old mod insulator. They have to be a mod insulator which has uh, topological order. And what do I mean by topological order? Uh, what I mean here very precisely uh, is that the if you put the system on a torus it must have additional low energy excitation on a torus that you cannot be described by quasi particles all right uh, something i have to just adjust my computer here it's, it's giving me some funny things why is it not charging up sorry ah oh, there okay okay i'm good all right so that's yeah so this is this is the statement right here so, so can, uh, can I ask a question about this? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this comes out, I mean, at the simplest level, it comes out from some mean field theory, but then you elevate yes. it to, to a Higgs mechanism in a, in a U1 gauge theory. So I'm just wondering what's the, you know, how confident are we in this statement? Like how has this been checked numerically or what is the level of confidence that these two phases do exist? You know, this distinct FL star phase exists. Maybe from numerics. Well, um, yes, so I, I'm just trying to remember. I think there have been some numerics of this type of thing. By, in fact, Tarun Grover had something, uh, and also Fakhar Asad recently. Uh, so that's one. Uh, on Then there's, uh, there you can all prove that this phase is stable. So suppose I start out with some model say uh, a certain Kagome lattice model where I, where I know for sure uh, that there's a spin a half spin liquid with a gap. Mm -hmm. I can start with that model and I can couple it to, uh, to the subconduction electrons. And then I can prove to all orders in the coupling because there's a gap on the side that the whole thing is stable. There's no, it's not unstable. This F on star phase is locally stable. I see, okay. So you can do that. Uh, the gauge theory really uh, is is very useful for the phase transition, mm -hmm. uh, and we that's what we addressed in this paper. We we also showed that the phase transition was an actual phase transition. So I I think you know I would say it's fair to say that there was earlier work by Pierce Coleman in particular where they. Uh, you know, they just raise the temperature and then as you raise the temperature, this hybridization boson or the slave boson 
uh, as he called it, uh, doesn't have a condensate anymore. Mm -hmm. So then you're getting uh, a phase like that. But I think before our work, the what you said was always assumed was that when you went to low enough temperatures in all systems, the slave boson would always condense. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, can, you know, yeah, so the question becomes, is this theory always in the Higgs phase? Can you find a non-Higgs phase? And is there a sharp phase transition? And and, right. and that's kind of the question that, uh, the fact that there isn't one actually first came up in a exactly solvable model on in a random cluster by uh, Berlin, Grempel, and George. And then, and then we showed at the level of the gauge theory in, in a non-random model that, yeah, but there is a stable phase transition that actually is a sharp transition, even at zero temperature. Okay, thank you. I, I've got another question, if I may. Sure. Yes. Uh, this is Bill Phillips. Uh, Hi, Bill. It, does it make any sense to think about this um, in terms of uh, spin charge separation? The, the reason I ask is it, 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 the story that you told about the, um, the original condo uh, effect sounds like there's complete spin charge separation, and then adding this in seems to make it less separated and, uh, or perhaps not separated at all. Does that make any sense? Uh, you put your finger on a very important thing, Bill, uh, but I would, say it's, I would say the opposite of what you said. So here, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in, in, in the FL phase where the F electron or in the condo effect uh, where the F electron becomes part of the Fermi surface. So what's happened is effectively at low enough energies, there is no spin charge separation because what's happened, you start with a model where microscopically it seems like, you know, the Fs are spins. So they look like, you know, for, you know, you can call them Fermi on the boson. They look like objects that only carry spin. Okay, that's what you started with. You started with a model where there's only spins, and then there's right. uh, electrons moving around there. So that's probably what you thought of as spin charge separation. So that's microscopically right. correct. But the large Fermi liquid phase with the large Fermi surface with condo screening shows you that at low energies there is no spin charge separation, meaning right. that. Right. The actual excitations on the Fermi surface are electron-like. That is, they both carry charge and spin. Okay, they have spin a half and charge E on the Fermi surface. So the heavy Fermi liquid phase, or the Higgs phase in the modern language, is has no spin charge separation in the end, even though microscopically you think it might. And the, on the other hand, the FL star phase that uh, we proposed the spin charge separation does survive. So now you have two types of excitations. You have one excitation on the Fermi surface, on the small Fermi surface, where there is no spin charge separation on those excitations. They're just electrons carry spin and charge. But there are excitations here, on roughly on the F-band, which carry spin but no charge, even at low energies. And so in this case, with FL star, there is fractionalization, which is the word I prefer, is a more general concept, but, and, and more precise, uh, and spin charge separation. In, uh, on. And, and, and Shabir, this is the reason, in fact, Latinja theorem is valid. And I thought that's what you told yes, me. Yes, correct. That's correct, my question. Correct. That's the yes. formal reason Latinja theorem is valid, because spin ons are separate here, right? Yeah. Right. If I may also comment, you know, people, you know, sometimes, you know, you can have excitations, which even in a normal Fermi liquid, which carries both spin and charge, you could have a, some kind of a pair of electrons which form a triplet. Uh, so that, so you, you know, so then initially my, the phrase spin charge separation then becomes a little bit ambiguous. Uh, but what, when people talk about spin charge separation, what they really mean is the following. And that when you have an excitation with an odd electric charge, it must have half integer spin. If you have an excitation with even electric charge, uh, it must have an excitation with integer spin. Very all, even can be zero also. Uh, um, and so if if that's the case, if you if odd charge is associated with half integer spin and even charge is associated with integer spin, you have no spin charge separation. 
On the other hand, if the odd even exchange, that is you can have an excitation with even charge, but half integer spin, that's when we have spin charge separation. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. That's the more precise statement. <laughs> right. So it's all about oddness and evenness and half or not. That's really actually the key thing. Subir, can I ask a question regarding the dimensionality? So yes. I think FL star uh, can only exist in two and three dimensions, but how about FL? Can that be existing? Uh, can, can you realize that in one dimension, for example? Uh, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So one day is special. Uh, in one day, everything is a lattice liquid. There is no difference between FL star and FL, formally speaking. Uh, and there is a rigorous theorem I think proved by Oshikawa and Affleck, who showed that if you have a conducting metal, then you know there must be. You, know, you just look at all the Fermi points, which are sharply defined uh, locations in in momentum space, that they must obey some analog of the Lattentier theorem, which counts all the electrons. Okay, uh, so the topological order that I need here only makes sense in two and higher dimensions. And so the FL star phase only exists in two and higher dimensions. Uh, and of course the FL, you know, FL, uh, as you know, it's only free fermions can show it in one dimension. And the moment you have any interaction, you get a lot of liquid. You know, whether you call that a Fermi liquid or not, matter of taste, but it's almost like a Fermi liquid. But does gauge theory is uh, non-compact, uh, given that you're saying it's stable in 2D? Uh, well, uh, right. So, um, right. So the I will, So the gauge groups we're considering is always compact, you know, because this, for example, is defined on the lattice. So this, the moment you have this representation, then the gauge group is compact because it's, mm -hmm. there's an e to the i theta here. Uh, so now the question becomes, you know, is yeah. So if this was a u one spin liquid. Uh, would the would this uh, monopoles in the gauge group uh, share a compact gauge group? Would they destroy this phase? And they could. Uh, so that's why, for in at least for the U1 case, you would need a spin-on Fermi surface for this thing to be stable. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, yes. But if you had a, uh, you know, if this was a Z2 spin liquid, it'd be fine. It could have a gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's showing the stability of the case where. Is a spin-on Fermi surface. You know, that's a complicated system issue, which uh, I think uh, there's very nice work by uh, Hermely et al. That's really a question about the mod insulator, the spin-on Fermi surface table in the mod insulator. And I think the general view today is yes, yes, yes it is, because the monopoles are suppressed by the spin-on Fermi surface. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Uh, so. This is the spin on Fermi surface, violet legend the theorem. Right. So then there's the phase transition, uh, if you care about such things. But and that's where the gauge theory language becomes uh, indispensable. It's really a, 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 a transition in which you go from uh, what you would call a, a Higgs phase here, which is the Fermi liquid is the Higgs phase. Uh, definitely the world's most complicated way to talk about the Fermi liquid. Uh, but the Higgs boson uncondenses, and you get a deconfined phase uh, of the gauge theory, which is FL star. So this kind of deconfinement or fractionalization is essential to to allow the violation of uh, Lattentier's theorem. Okay, all right. So that's great. So can why can't we just apply this to the cube rates? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, here I have an example anyway. Here's, an, I think, a pretty well established example of a transition from metal to metal where the carrier density jumps by one. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, okay. And, and there's no broken symmetry. It's a pure, just a entanglement phase transition, if you wish. Okay. So, so why not I just apply this to the cuprates? Well, it, Many reasons. One is that uh, this just I just mentioned this uh, in the 
uh, in our response to Leo's question. If you want to do a theory for the metal metal transition, you do have to take the case in this model, but this is a spin on Fermi surface. Uh, and and this, that's not a reasonable choice for everything we know about the square lattice antiferromagnet. Okay. Um, now, in some cases, in some experiments like the electron dope cuprates or in high magnetic field, you do see some type of uh, magnetic order in the low doping regime. And it's not so easy to extend this theory to that. Uh, and of course, most importantly, this is really a physics I've described as a physics of a condo lattice. Uh, where some of the electrons um, go into a mod insulators and others don't. Now, when you have two bands, that's a totally natural thing. You know, just take the electrons that are F and make them a mod insulator. But on the cuprates, there is no such two band. There's only all electrons, are, there's only one band. Just, you can't, how do you choose which electron to localize and which not? Now, some people might say, well, this means that you should really have the copper ox, you should take the, uh, Two band model with oxygen sites. But really, I don't think that's reasonable because uh, experiments never show a second band. If you actually look at the band uh, in the high doping regime where you see a large Fermi surface, you never see any oxygen band or a copper band. I don't care whether the electrons really on the copper or the oxygen. There's just one band that you see in the experiment very clearly. There's no sign of any other band. So it's really a one band model in some any reasonable low energy limit below the mod cap. Uh, okay, so that's, so that's the question we are going to now uh, address. How do we get some physics like this uh, in a one band model? And given the time, I'm sure I won't have any time to say, go to topic three. So I'll just show a few pictures of what we've done and I probably have to stop there. Uh, right, okay, so it turns out at least the first part of the problem we can sort of solve, we can describe in a, in a, and have described in a fairly simple way, how to get a small Fermi surface in a one band model. Uh, and this is, so this, so let me just show you that in terms of pictures. Uh, specifically, this was, uh, I guess this particular model was first proposed by Wen and Lee uh, and what I'm presenting to you is uh, the simple picture that we developed later. Okay, so let's start with this picture of antiferromagnet with a few holes moving around. Uh, and of course, we don't have an antiferromagnet, so you want the spins to form singlets. Uh, so let's imagine they all form singlets. Uh, and, and these singlets start resonating with each other. Um, and then the holes also start moving. So that seems like, okay, I have a density of holes is P. I have no broken symmetry. Why isn't that completely the answer uh, to, the, to, the, to the puzzle for the what's happening in low doping? So this, we'd call this a hole on metal. And the reason this is not the answer is because the guys that are moving, these are carry charge, but no spin. So they'll form a Fermi surface, but that Fermi surface it will have small size P, uh, but it, it will be of some very strange objects called holons, which carry charge, odd integer charge, uh, but no spin. So they're spin charge separated. They're not electrons. So they wouldn't show up in photo emission. So if you did photo emission uh, on this state as written here, you wouldn't see even the Fermi arc because there's a gap to creating any spin. You have to have an object that both uh, is a small density, but doesn't have uh, this spin charge separation, at least on the object that's forming the Fermi surface. So how do we fix this? Well, we fix this by uh, creating a few spins. So initially it costs you some energy to create these spins, uh, and these spins can move around on their own. So now these objects carry spin, but no charge. Uh, and so that's spin charge separation. But now you imagine that you've created this object here that carries charge but no spin. You've created this object here that carries spin but no charge. Well, why don't I just bind them with each other? And in fact, they attract each other. So you just bind them. And so now this green object here is a linear combination of this state. It's like an electron, but it's sitting on a dimer, okay? So this dimer, 
the green dimer has charge E and spin a half, so no spin charge separation, uh, and that can move around. But there's also the background of the other blue dimers, which are going to resonate. Uh, and so now, now finally, we have a picture. So, oops, those attract and form a singlet. And now this is the picture of the pseudo gap state in the very tight binding limit, where you have charge E spin a half object moving, but they're not really moving freely. They're moving in a background of other singlets that they have to exchange with. And that, and the fact that you have these other singlets means that there's also a gauge field and there's also, uh, that has to keep track of these singlets. Uh, and there's also uh, excitation that carries spin but no charge, but they just cost more energy. So what's happened here is that it costs you energy to create a spin, uh, but then, you gain that energy back by binding with the hole. So in the end, maybe it's preferable to create this object. So, you know, you did a funny thing. You, you started with the electron, you broke it apart, uh, but then you bound it again. But of course, the key thing is you don't, didn't bind all of them again. You only bound density P of them again. And that gives you this FL star state. I should say there's actually pretty good evidence from ultra cold atom experiments in the last couple of years by since Bill Phillips at least was or still in the audience uh, from the experiments on the fermionic Hubbard model by Marcus Kreiner's group and also Emmanuel Bloch's group of, of, of this type of state. They actually see their, detect, their, their microscopic detections are pretty compatible with the pictures that I'm showing you here. Um, okay. All right, so that's uh, a picture then of this low doping regime of the Q. You phrase. Okay. Uh, the only trouble with it, well, there are many troubles with it. I guess I'm going to make, tell you what the troubles with it are. Oh, no, I'm not. Well, the main trouble with it is, first of all, okay, it's great as a theory for FL star, but can you go all the way to the Fermi liquid? I don't know how to do that with this, with this model. Uh, and we have tried many different ways, and I won't describe all my failures. Uh, I'll describe the latest idea, which I think uh, is quite exciting. Uh, the other trouble with this, this is sort of like uh, a very tight binding limit. You know, it's sort of like the BEC theory of a superconductor. Now, you know, in, in the BCS theory, we know in actual metals, uh, the Kupfer pairs all strongly overlap with each other. And that's surely the case here in the cuprase too, uh, that, you know, these, uh, these, uh, these objects, green objects and the blue objects in reality are strongly overlapping with each other. So we need a better theory, and hopefully that better theory can also give you a theory of the phase transition, but you get back the old Fermi liquid. Okay, so I'll skip that. So that's, uh, so I'll just tell you what the new theory is. Uh, we haven't fully solved it, but I, we have a, it, I'm able to give you a simple physical picture of how this thing can work. And it's really very much inspired by this condo lattice model. And it has some new ideas, uh, of using ancilla qubits. Uh, and this, I should say, of course, uh, the idea, main idea is really due to uh, Yahoo Zhang, who's a postdoc at Harvard. Okay, so here's the idea. So here's our cuprate model uh, that we are working with, electrons moving around here. And we want to be able to describe these two phases. One phase, which is a Fermi liquid, the other is this Ethel star. Uh, in a way that unifies them and also gives you theory of the phase transition and gives you a lot of other flexibility to having all different kinds of spin liquids here. So the way we're going to do it uh, is introduce some extra degrees of freedom. Uh, you might say, wait a minute, this is all crazy. Why are you introducing extra degrees of freedom? But actually, this is quite a familiar thing. We already did it in the condo lattice. You know, when we wrote the spin in terms of an F electron, we did introduce an extra degree of freedom because now we are allowed for the possibility that there's charge fluctuation on the uh, on the F site, even though there it isn't allowed. We just introduced it for a while and then we projected it out by doing the gauge theory. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to introduce some extra degrees of freedom and then use the magic of gauge theory to get rid of it. Uh, so then why bother? Well, the reason you want to bother with extra degrees of freedom is something we also see in quantum information theory. By having some extra degrees of freedom and entangling them, 
in some way, and then projecting them out, uh, you can get new types of entanglement in your physical layer. It's often the simplest way to write down some more complicated wave function to do this. And in fact, one place that Yahui was very much inspired by in coming up with this idea is actually the haldane Pasquier theory of bosons at nu equals one. If you look at their theory of bosons at nu equals one, uh, they introduce, they write the bosons in terms of electrons with many more electrons than there were originally bosons and then projecting them out uh, to get the, uh, the hepron leaf reach state of a Fermi surface of bosons at nu equals one. So anyway, so there's a lot of precedent for doing these kinds of things. So what, what, what do we hear? Let me just explain in this context. Uh, well, we uh, introduced two layers of ancilla spins or qubits, okay, S1 and S2. And what we're going to do is couple them together with uh, some exchange coupling J perp, which is going to be very large. In the end, we're going to send it to infinity, but not right away. We want to send J perp to infinity. So if J perp is infinity, uh, these two spins just form a singlet and be frozen in singlets forever, okay? Right. So that's the boring phase. Uh, you know, that's it's as if you didn't even have them. They just form singlets and they're frozen. Uh, and then the conduction electron do whatever they want. Uh, and, you know, in weak coupling theory, they just form a Fermi surface of large size one plus P. So this is my wave function. It's just band theory. Band theory for the electrons and these extra degrees of freedom are frozen in singlets. Okay, so I haven't done anything. Uh, and, uh, and in a specific model, you could imagine there's some coupling JD here. So this is the case when JD is very small, you just ignore, so ignore this extra degrees of freedom. But now let's try to crank up JD a little bit, at least just try to think of this model before we go to the fancy gauge theory. Maybe you're going to project out these completely. But for now, let's imagine we do that. So what are we going to do? Okay, so I've gotten the theorem of weight for that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take one layer and treat this layer and this conduction electron like a condo lattice. So I spent the first part of my talk talking about uh, you know the top two layers here, just these two layers. So that's that's a condo lattice. So I'm ignoring this J perp here. So this condo lattice, and let's imagine that this condo lattice forms a metal. So it, there's condo screening. So these spins uh, get condo screened by the conduction electrons. So the whole thing will form a big heavy Fermi liquid. Uh, and that will have density, you had density one plus P here. This will give you density one. So the total density will be two plus P. So the size of the Fermi surface will be two plus P, but you only measure things modulo two so it will be P. So you'll get a small Fermi surface here uh, by uh, forming a condo lattice of the first two. And then what about the second layer? It's still there uh, and they'll form a spin liquid now. Okay, so this is the wave function if you wish. You have a, a large Fermi surface of the first layer and the physical electrons and a spin liquid of the second layer. Uh, and that's our theory for the FL star. Okay, in fact, here's an actual variational wave function, which I wasn't able to write down before. Here it is. And of course, in the end, you project out everything on the hidden layers into singlets so that the final wave function is only involves the physical degrees of freedom. It's still a wave function only on the physical layer. You know, even this is exactly just a wave function for actual electrons. You may not like how I came up with it, but there it is. It's a trial wave function you can now try to work with. Um, Okay, so that's the basic idea, and uh, oh, I'm kind of near the end of my talk. So yeah, so now of course again now this violates the Lutton theorem because the Fermi surface size is p, but that's fine because there is now this topological order spin liquid sitting in the second hidden layer. Uh, so there's a modern way to say all this. You know what we've learned is all these Lutton theorems. Uh, and all these constraints that come out are sort of like anomalies. There are anomalies associated with uh, charge conservation and translational symmetry. Uh, and what these hidden layers give you is a very simple way of making sure that all these anomalies are perfectly well obeyed at all stages, you know, no matter what you do. Uh, and they ensure that because 
you know, this, this, the bilayer is the, you know, simplest anomaly free situation you can write down. It's got, uh, you know, no, no interesting, uh, it's just totally inert uh, and uh, doesn't make any contribution to any Lattinger like theorem or anomaly or anything like that. But then you can use it to, to get more interesting phases where there are anomalies and in fact, even cases where the Lattinger like bit uh, the Linger theorem is not not obeyed. Uh, okay. All right. So this is some band structure which looks you can get Fermi arcs and so on and so forth. And finally, you can address the issue of the phase transition. Okay. So this is for probably for the experts. So how do we do this? Uh, so I just say that and uh, then go to my conclusions. Uh, so you you have the electron. Or, or let's, it, all of the fancy stuff happens on the hidden layers because that's where you have to project out. So you write the hidden layer fermions in terms of, as a two by two matrix in this way. Uh, and this way of writing it, uh, what you see is that left multiplication corresponds to spin rotation and right multiplication corresponds to number rotation. So it turns out that to, first of all, make sure these are spins, you have to make sure that uh, the theory is gauge invariant under right rotations, and this is the SU2. So you get SU2 one and SU2 two for the for the two layers, uh, and this is precisely the same SU2 that's used by uh, Lee, Nagoso, and Wen in their famous RMP. But you also have to lock the spins into singlet, and you do that by a left rotation, the same left rotation in the two. Uh, and this is the kind of thing we have been using. So we kind of unified. Uh, the Harvard MIT approaches in this model, uh, and uh, and then we get at least to begin with an SU2 cross SU2 cross SU2 theory. Okay, that seems like a huge mess, uh, but in the end, most of those SU2s are broken, and you're left with for the interesting case from FL star to FL to an SU2 cross U1 slash Z2 gauge theory, and this is all emergent, uh, and of course it's a curious coincidence that SU2 cross U1, not the Z2. Uh, is also the gauge group of the weak, weak interaction, uh, electroweak theory. But this, okay, 